and who may access to the mountain of the Lord who may stand in his holy place isn't he who has a clean hands and a pure heart who has not lifted up his soul to any idol nor sworn to any deceit he has received blessings and righteousness from the god of his salvation and father god this is our desire this morning that we shall become this heart because this heart oh my to god you never disappoint this morning oh my to god we want to declare and to decree that we are not going to be sad we are not going to be angry we are not going to be bitter but we purpose to open a door of our hearts that we will allow in all that which pertains godliness because every time we shall continue to be knitted together with you that in all our works father god we shall be able to find you we shall see you just like the way you are fear us all the more almighty god fear us all the more almighty god and till we shall take no more almighty god and when almighty god we have this overflow we can be able to impact it almighty god to others in our family in our city almighty god in our nation almighty god and to the nations of the earth almighty god we want to thank you thank you father because of that what you are doing in our midst holy ghost holy ghost we thank you that you are in this place this morning do what you love to do heal the sick bring them almighty god that are far away from you that they will be able almighty god to come closer to thee because this is who you are almighty god and father we thank you and father we lift up your holy name even as we continue almighty god to continue to remain in that position of sinking deep sinking deep in you because this is what you want us to become and father we give you praise and father we give you all the honor and all the adoration because this is who you are come on lift your hands to jesus just lift your hands close your eyes his presence is here right now i'm wide awake come on Deep breath. I breathe you in, I lead into your love. Oh, 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 your love. Isn't it amazing to be in his presence? This is one day I want you to get drowned, to just drown, you know. Our, our natural tendencies and we don't want to first of all we don't want to get wet and, and we don't want to drown but I want to tell you God wants to drown you this morning he wants you to sink deep into his love he wants to baptize you all over again in baptism you got to get all the way under hallelujah <laughs> just, just just turn to someone close shake three hands and say I'm sinking deep today come on you guys Sydney so glad you're here Awesome you guys. Thank you.
Wow. Amen. <laughs> Woo! If you're not sinking fast enough, just get some lead weights. <laughs> Amen. We welcome you. We just honor those who deserve honor. Amen. Well, Pastor Jan, welcome back. Mike, Jan, Mark, we welcome and honor you guys today. It's good to have you back. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen, amen. Well, we have dignitaries from the North. Brother Jeff, get up here. What, I don't know. What God did something. Uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, we got a saturation Saturday coming up here, June fifth, and uh, you need to you need to get you know uh, we're drowning right now. I don't know, but <laughs> amen, amen. So uh, we uh, the first Saturday of the month, uh, we it was kind of postponed Saturday because the first was the first, so we did it on the eighth just because of that timing. But wow. Um, and not all of you were here, um, but that's okay. The people that were supposed to be were here, and there's people coming from far and wide. The, you know, God's renown travels fast. So Saturation Saturdays, worship and prophecy. Not really going to do any preaching. We're going to have prophets in the house. They're going to come from different places. They're going to have words to you to the body we're going to do some ministry afterwards so i've been walking this out i don't know for a while i came into a church service on a thursday night randy bach in revival was leading sur re surgery yeah he was leading surgery he was he was leading surgery he had the gown of the lord i could tell and um uh, and it changed my life because I stepped into that river, into the river. This is what the Lord says in Ezekiel 35, verse 24. For I will take you from among the nations. There are a few nations here today. Gather you out of all countries and bring you into your own land. And I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you. And cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will keep my commandments and do them. And then you shall dwell in the land that I gave your fathers. And you shall be my people. And I will be your God. And I will deliver you from all your uncleanliness. I will call for the grain and multiply it. And bring no famine among you. When did he say you were going to do anything? He said, I will do this, I will do this, I will do this, and as a bonus, after I cleanse you and give you a new heart, a new heart I will bless you with grains and abundance, and there will be no famine among you. I struggled for so many years until I just said, okay, God, I can't do it anymore. I don't know what you want to do with this, this. I don't know what you can do with this, but whatever you want to do with this, I'll do it. And he's blessed me. And he's blessed me. And he's blessed me again. And he blessed me last night. And he blessed me the day before. And he just keeps blessing me. He just keeps doing it. I, it's like I'm, I'm like a favorite son or something. I don't know. <laughs> well, you don't like the Old Testament, so let's go to the New Testament, you know. I know how you are. I know how you are. You don't like the Old Testament, so let's, let's just go here. Jesus, oh, I lost my marker, praise God, but I know where it is, I, I, I have to get there, oh Lord, help me, help me, help me, you know, you, you sit there in the spirit, God gives you a scripture, and then he says, okay, all right, all right, so Jesus said this, in John 7, verse 37, on the last day, that great day of the feast, you know, Pentecost is coming up. 
next Sunday. Yeah, it's my birthday. Yeah, yeah, Pentecost is coming up. On that last day, and Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And by this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. I'm just saying, if you want, I mean, we do church services, we do baptism services, we do all kinds of services. But if you really want to get all this junk broken off in your life, we had so many people that got things washed off them. You know, I woke up Sunday morning and I felt like I should pray in the Spirit. And after 35 years of being baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, 35 years, and I woke up with a brand new prayer language. It was like there was a new car in the, in the garage. I, I had to take it out for a spin. I couldn't stop praying, you know? It was just like, wow, this is really cool. This isn't some like little five vowel baby language. This is like full blown with accessories. So I called a friend and I said, hey, you can't believe you weren't there last night, but let me tell you what happened. And let me tell you about this. And they said, well, can I hear it? I said, oh, yeah. And I started to pray in that new language. I got one sentence out. Then God gave me the interpretation. Then I got another sentence. Then he gave me the interpretation. It was a prophecy for that person. And, and it went on and on. And, and, I, and then when they were done crying, you know, I'm just telling you that God, God is going to do, I mean, if he can do something new in me, what can he do in you? So June 5th, Saturday night, I know there's reruns of something that you really wanted to watch. There's something on Netflix, but I'll tell you what, there is nothing more dynamic than what God is going to do right here, and you could be a part of it. Yeah, well, yes, uh, bless the Lord. Yeah. yeah, there's nothing really good on Netflix. Have you ever tried, have you figured that out? And it's not real. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Could the ushers come forward? I just want to remind you at the end of our service uh, today, uh, we will be receiving our tithes and offerings. And maybe you're here today and you don't have an offering envelope yet. Just lift your hands and these good looking ushers will get that to you right now. Just leave your hands up. Don't be embarrassed by that. And we will meet that need. You know, Pentecost Sunday is uh, next Sunday. Say Pentecost. What is the day of Pentecost all about? Well, if you go back and, and you study the, the structure of worship that God ordained, he said, I want you to do something. I want you to have a Passover every year, and I want you to have a Passover lamb to take away the sin of the world. Amen? And who is our Passover lamb? Jesus. And so uh, God gave a picture hundreds of years, thousands of years before he actually did it of the solution for the sin in your heart. Amen. That's what uh, the Passover is all about, to remove this, the death angel from your life. And then he said, guys, this is what I want you to do. 50 days later, say 50 days, I want you to gather together the first fruits. Say first fruits. So that's the beginning of the harvest. And he said, I want you to gather the first, first fruits, and I want you to bring it into the house of God. Hallelujah. And they called it the, 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 the Feast of Weeks because it lasted a whole week. All right? And so what, what happened on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after Jesus uh, was died and, and resurrected? What happened? Well, the Holy Spirit was poured out. Amen? Amen? Do you realize that you are God's first fruits? You're the first fruits. You see, those people were the first to believe Jesus is Lord. Amen. And they belong to him. Amen. You belong to Jesus. How many have figured that out yet? You see, and the moment you belong to Jesus, you become the first fruits. And so what does God ask us to do? He's always asked the same thing. He said, just continue to bring your first fruits into the house. 
Amen. So every time you give an offering, every time you bring your tithes, what are you doing? It's a symbol. It's a picture of what God has always wanted to do, and that is to pour out his spirit upon all flesh and fill the, the, the earth with his glory. So every time you give to God and you say, I'm giving you my first fruits, <laughs> it's only a picture of your heart because gi you're giving your heart back to God. Did that help you today? So it's a wonderful thing. It's not that God is after our money. He doesn't need our money. But with the natural side of our offerings, that's how we care for the poor. That's how we create new buildings in the back that are falling down. Are you getting this? Amen. That's how we pay for the air conditioner for you to feel comfortable. Amen. But on the spiritual side, uh, Jesus says, you, you give the natural gift, but I receive the worship. I receive the thanksgiving that you attached to that. That's why it's so important you always give uh, with a heart of generosity, with a heart of praise and thanksgiving. Not because you're coerced into do it. I don't want any of you to be coerced. But at the end of our service, just give with joy. There's a couple ways uh, you can do it. You can text to give uh, if, if you don't have... Uh, if you don't feel comfortable doing the other, and uh, you can also give through our new website um, on mygct.life. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, is there any woman here, or do, does any of you know a woman named Deborah? Do you know a woman named Deborah? Okay, then Merlin, get up here. Oh, he's not here now. Okay. Okay. Um, Merlin, don't leave the room when I call on your name. I'm going to pick on you. This is a man of God. Uh-oh. Is that a bag or a purse? There's two people. There's not, a, there's, there's not a woman named Deborah here, but there are two ladies that know someone that have a relationship with that's named Deborah. So would you come up here and share the vision God gave you? You're forgiven. I don't know. Should we forgive him? I guess. It's kind of left over from that Saturday night with Jeff and you. This morning around 4 o'clock, God gave me Deborah. And I was real concerned about Deborah because God told me, he showed me like a piece of skin. And it was, a, it was the only thing. It's a strand flesh that was holding her life together. And uh, she's not going to be with us much longer. So uh, if, if we don't. So I, anyway, I asked God, what, is, what are you telling me? By the way, my brother back here, he looked up Deborah for me on the phone. And uh, it's B, B-E-E, -E, in Hebrew, in case you know somebody named B. And uh, Deborah turns out to be a fantastic leader and saves a whole bunch of folks. Anyway, so devil, the devil's trying to take her out. So I talked to Lord about it, and he says, well, her age has got seven in it. 17, 27, 37. I felt like it was 37. But uh, anyway, he told me that uh, he, wa he wants to give her a companion. It's going to come in 10 days, 10 weeks, 10 months. Felt like it was 10 months, but... And, uh, and then he gave me Jethro, and he gave me Leroy. I think Jethro might be a, a leader in her life, uh, someone of substance, father, uncle, somebody that she respects, maybe her pastor in the past, some leader. And, uh, and as I prayed on it, he reminded me of the eye, and I had somebody in my car, one of our gals who works in ophthalmology, and when, we, when she was formed, like all of us were formed, when we were babies in the womb, and God was making our little brains and making our little eyes, there's actually, she says, I thought it was a million, but she says 350 strands come from your brain, and 350 strands, 350,000 strands come from your eye. I read this in a book. I thought it was a million, but she corrected me and said it's about 350,000, and they actually come together between your eye and your brain. I don't know how much distance that is, but maybe it's that long or that long. But anyway, there's a strand. Remember, I saw a pink strand. I saw a fleshy strand. And I said, she's intricately, you know, God says you're intricately and 
wonderfully made. He knows the right words, but you know, God says you're wonderfully made. And you got this eye that God makes right in the side of your mama. And the strands actually hook up and touch each other. And that's what he wants to do this woman. Of course, he wants to do that with all of our lives, doesn't he, Pastor? So she's intricately and wonderfully made. So I'm going to pray for her. And I just believe God is going to do a wonderful work. By the way, 3 to 4% of those strands are colors, like red and red and blue and blue and green and gray. My father-in-law always wore green, kind of an ugly-looking green suit to church because he didn't get all the strands exactly right. Well, he didn't have anything to do with it. They just didn't match up. But God really wants to match up those strands, you know, that you're, you're intricately and... Just think, 353,000 strands between your eye and your brain, and they have to all match up. It's, I mean, it's supposed to be a fact. According to my friend Cheryl back there who works in ophthalmology, she says it is a fact. She's way back in the back. But uh, so, Father God, you made B. You made this woman. You made each one of us. We ask, Lord, that your will be done, that you be glorified. We ask, Lord, that you would come along beside her and strengthen her. And I believe it's through someone. I don't know what Jethro means yet. I brought my book, but I couldn't find it in my book. So, Father God, I pray for someone to come alongside this woman and encourage her. I pray that for every one of us, too, by the way. That we just won't hang on, but we'll fulfill our destiny. Because I believe this woman is called a leadership. And if it's one of these women, the name Deborah, that these people know, Father God, you have a big plan for their life. I pray as they share this little story with them, that it will strengthen them, encourage them, but also help them to move into their destiny. So I'm still carrying the burden, and I'll carry it until it's done. Because we'll believe for it. Amen? Thank you, Mark. That's good. Amen. Amen. That's good. So in this great, you've, you've come to a church where we can talk about you behind your back when you're not even here. Yeah, maybe Deborah, maybe you're watching online. Yeah. Isn't it great to be together? Uh, this, uh, this end of this month, on the 30th of May, we have a, a new fresh apostolic voice for this house coming, an Indian ministry by the name of Prakish Daniel. And I want to let you know in advance, he will be here for Memorial Day weekend uh, that Sunday morning. A man filled with joy and wisdom, and God sent him here to minister to you. So mark your calendars. You're not going to want to miss this. Who is this guy? Well, I don't know. We're going to get to meet him together. But there's a place in my heart that's that's missing ever since Dr. John Arul, who's a great man from India, has, has passed. And so this man here might be the younger version of him. So we're going to find out together. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Last week was such a great week together. And so many of you, your lives were changed and you'll never be the same. And I want to continue that uh, subject on matters of the heart. Uh, is that okay? And uh, we'll go on this uh, for a few weeks as the Lord would allow us to do it. I think it's important to recognize that you, you have a heart. That God cares about. Jeff even talked about it. He almost stole my message today. And that he's giving us a new heart. Amen. You know, sometimes things get so impossible in life. All you do is make it worse. How many have you ever been there? And, and, it, and, it, and there, it really is impossible. But you've got to remember how wonderful Jesus is. He says, ah, that's okay. Guess what? I can fix it. I can give you a new heart. And we go, oh, how do you do that? And, and rather than asking how, just receive the grace of God. Amen. So today is a great day. Uh, verse we used last week was in uh, Proverbs 4.23. Remember that? It says, keep your heart with all diligence. Why should you do that? Because out of it spring the issues uh, of life. That issues, all of the boundaries, all the deliverance, all the power, all the wisdom, the source of everything that you're praying about, it's going to come through your heart. No other way will it get to you. You'd say, well, ba- pastor, someone can pray for me. Yeah, but it has to first be filtered through your heart. So keep your heart. Say keep your heart. Keep your heart. 
Now, Jesus talked about the heart also over in Matthew 12. Um, as I shared last week, Jesus was talking to the Pharisees. And these people thought their hearts were perfect, that they had arrived. And Jesus said, hey, guys, let me help you here. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. If you have a good tree and it's bearing bad fruit, that's an impossibility and you're very confused. Amen? And so what does he say? He, he was not nice. He said, brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So there's a secret here. The creator is trying to let you know that whatever's in your heart, you're going to speak it out of your mouth. You cannot prevent it. Amen. Then he goes on in verse 35. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what? Good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. And then he concludes by saying, but I say to you that even for every idle word men may speak. That word idle means unemployed, not doing anything. Have you ever spoken a word that was not attached to anything? Oh, look out. Jesus said, don't do that because you'll give account of it <laughs> on the day of judgment. For by your words... You will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. So that's a kind of a heavy thing. I don't know about you. I get confronted every time I read that. But Jesus is trying to tell us about the heart. Keep your heart, because out of the heart, all the issues come. And if, if what you treasure in your heart is good, you'll bring forth good. But if the treasure in your heart is evil, you can't stop it. It will produce evil. Amen? Amen. So how do you know what you treasure in your heart? He tells us, just listen to the words that you're speaking. <laughs> See, he's, he's trying to help us. You know, many times the things that we treasure here are actually our enemy and we don't know it. Right? We don't realize it. But Jesus said, what is in abundance in the heart is always what you're going to speak out of your mouth. Amen. Hallelujah. You can't hide it. So here's the question that I asked. Can we change the treasure? And yeah, you can. Turn to your neighbor and say, yes, I can do this. <laughs> See, but what, what, what happens? You see, the devil is a liar. How many know that? And Satan comes to entice you or to seduce you or to plant a suggestion here. Why does he do that? So that you might grab a hold of it and put it here as a treasure and protect it. Because whatever you allow inside of your heart, since, you know, how many, we're really very sensitive about what we let inside of us, right? So if you allow that, that thing that started here to get here, it becomes part of your treasure chest. And at that point, if what you are believing is false and not real, and you allow it to get into, into here as a treasure, guess what? The devil doesn't have to do anything else because you'll do it all for him. And that's what we've been doing for centuries. Amen. So you can't hide it. But if you don't like the fruit that you see coming out of you, if you don't like the outcome that's coming out of your life, don't just say, well, that's just the way I am. It's too late. Don't do that because that's just your hurt talking. That's just that treasure inside of your heart speaking. Hallelujah. It's not you. Because God gives you a future and a hope. Hallelujah. He's given you a new heart and a new spirit. Amen. Say amen. amen. So, so how do we change the outcome of our life? Change the treasure that's in your heart. 
And, and I, I must remind you, Jesus is talking to believers here. He's not just talking to sinners. Amen. When we change the treasure of our heart, we change the fruit of our life. It's not a 12-step program. It's not, a, it's not a tape series you have to listen to. No, no, it's nothing outwards in. You, you change what you value here and everything else will become supernaturally. You see, the treasure in your heart, what you value here, that determines all of your choices for you. Can you see how wonderful life can become? When you make Jesus the absolute Lord of every part of your life. What a wonderful possibility. God promised. Say God promised. He promised he'll give you a new heart. He promised he'll give you a, a right spirit in, in you. And what he wants to do is far more uh, wonderful than anything you can possibly imagine. So it's good to dream, but God has more for you than that. Say, God has more for you. Yeah. See, when you begin to treasure Jesus more than you treasure yourself, amazing things will begin to happen in your life. So the first step we have to do, church, into heart health. I want a healthy heart. How about you? The first step we have to take, say first step. you got to ask God to examine your heart. The very thing we don't want to do, that's what we have to do. Amen. Psalms 139, David's prayer, search me, O God. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Amen. Amen. Have you ever done that? Have you ever made that your prayer? See, God will always lead you, but then you have to follow. And I must remind you, we're just ordinary people, but we're becoming extravagant followers of Jesus. That's all you have to do because he will lead you in the way everlasting. Oh, hallelujah. So God will answer this prayer for you. And as you pray like this and begin to search the Lord in your prayer closet, you'll discover something. I discovered this. The number one enemy of your heart is guilt and shame. That's the number one. And we get in a habit of treasuring that. We make shame our treasure. Because it's so strong in us. Because the guilt become, becomes so demanding. Rather than removing it, we just do whatever it demands. Go all the way back to creation in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 25. God makes this amazing statement. He says, speaking of Adam and Eve, he says, And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Circle that word naked. It's a Hebrew word, ahrom, A-H-R-O-M-E. And of course, if you, if you know anything about Hebrew, ah, yah, is the name of God. So God had attached himself to Adam and Eve. Can you see that? This was before sin was in the earth, okay? And you know the story. This is before Adam gave the dominion away that God had given to him, before he gave it to Satan, okay? And, and, and so in this position, there was no guilt. And there was no shame. And Adam and Eve were clothed, or they were covered with glory, that's the best way we can put it. We, they didn't have clothes on like we do, but they had something on. It was the glory of God. They didn't need clothes because you couldn't really see past the glory. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? 
They were already close. But then something happened. Say something happened. You know the story. Satan enticed Eve. They, they rebelled and sin was brought into the earth. And when sin came into the earth, the glory that was upon Adam was removed. So if you compare in, in Genesis 3.10, God comes down to talk with Adam like he always did. And Adam responds to God. He says, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And of course, you know the story. God said, well, who told you you were naked? Where did that come from? Right? But this word naked, say, circle it, it's a different word. In English Bibles, it's the same word. It's not the same word. It's the Hebrew word echrom, E-H-R-O-M-E. doesn't look like a big difference. But what it's saying is that the glory is removed. And yeah, they didn't have any clothes on. And notice, I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Because they were exposed, now they were ashamed. Right? We can all identify this with this, right? The struggle with shame is our common denominator. Because we all have it at times in our life. Amen? Paul writes, I mean, Peter, um, David writes in Psalm 44, verse 15, My disgrace is before me all day long. You don't want to look in the mirror because the only thing you see is your disgrace. My face is covered with what? Shame. Think of all the men and women, the stories, uh, Abraham and Sarah. She had no children. She was barren. And in that culture, if you had no children, that was shameful. So what did Sarah do? Shame will cause you to do stupid things. To try to get out of it? Sarah had the great idea. Abraham, I know, Abe, this is what you do. Take my maidservant. Maybe if you can make her pregnant, my shame will go away. How many know that didn't work out very well? It only made it worse. If you listen to the voice of shame and do what it's asking you to do, it'll only make it worse. How many know what I'm talking about? God comes to Gideon. Remember Gideon? Who was Gideon? Well, he was the weenie. He was the weakest. The, the, the whole country was uh, uh, under the, the uh, control of enemies. They had lost the war. And Gideon's identity was, I come from the weakest, the smallest of all clans. I am full of shame. So what was he doing? He was hiding out. It's amazing how God always looks for one who's full of shame so he can get the glory. I wonder about that. Remember Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan? He was a crippled because one of the maidservants dropped him as a baby. And so he had the shame of disability. Amen. How about David himself when he committed adultery and murder to have Bathsheba for himself? The shame of adultery. Wow. Wow. Moving to the New Testament, remember there was a woman with an issue of blood that she could not control for, what was it, 38 years, 12, 12 years, say 12 years. Let's go back in time, 12 years, that would be what? 2010, ladies, you've not been able to control your cycle for, since 2010, how would that make you feel? Well, in that culture, if that happened to you, well, God has rejected you, and you cannot do anything about it. That's what they were told. And so this woman was covered with shame. But God did something in her heart, didn't he? And he removed, not only healed her body, but he removed the shame 
I like this. I like this. Remember Bartimaeus with blind Bartimaeus? The shame of being a beggar. And how about Judas? The shame of betraying the master. All of these individuals, God intervened and removed the shame, except for Judas, because he did what the shame dictated to him to do. We have to change these treasures in our heart, or we'll just make it worse. Aren't you glad you came today? So the question is, how do we remove guilt and shame? Well, as uh, Jeff already shared, you, you can't do it, can you? But there are things we can do to cooperate with God. Number one, accept God's forgiveness and love. Maybe you're here today and you've never given your heart to Jesus. You think we're nuts? Maybe you've been a, a Christian, a believer for many years, and you say, well, I've already done that. No, you're missing the point. It, this has to be a, a current, present tense acceptance. You have to accept God's forgiveness. So, so to accept his forgiveness, first you have to admit that you have sinned, that you've made a mistake. Right? So don't pretend this morning that you're okay. Is this okay? Can I do a little brain surgery? Is this okay? Is it, can we do some heart surgery this morning? Don't, don't blame someone else for the mistake that you have made. And don't use your past as an excuse why you cannot be helped. Because God is greater than our hearts. But you must accept God's love. Now, where do, we, where do you do this? In your heart. See, in your heart. God has done everything he needs to do. He's already done it all. That's necessary to forgive you personally and to make it a reality in your life. But you still must accept what he says. It must become personal to you. Let the war be over. Accept God's remedy for your shame. Quit fighting against him. No, that other book won't help you. Taking that course on, on, on uh, the internet won't help you. No, you just have to believe what God has spoken to you. Quit trying to earn it. Quit trying to improve. Just agree with God that Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only life that works, period. Hallelujah. There is no other answer. There is no other remedy. Hallelujah. And when you know that you're guilty, come on, church. When you know that you're covered with shame, have you ever been there when the reality of that hit you? When you're in that space, accepting God's forgiveness in your heart is the only thing you can do. But to do that, it will require you to trust him. To trust him. Where? Where? Where do you have to trust him? In your heart. What are you doing when you go through the agony of that type of thing? Have you ever gone through this type of thing? Isn't it anguish? Isn't it a challenge? Why is it such a challenge? Because you're changing the treasure in your heart. You're letting go of what you have valued for so many years. And you're trusting God that what he promised, he will actually perform it. 
And you've never gone this way before. And so you have to trust him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want you to declare this with me. I want you to speak it out of your mouth, out of your own heart. Say this with me, Psalm 71. In you, you. O Lord, Lord. I put my trust. Let me never be put to shame. Come on, lift your right hand. Say it with me. In you, O Lord, I put my trust. Let me never be put to shame. One more time. Hallelujah. In you, O Lord, I put my trust. Let me never be put to shame. Only God removes the shame. How does he do it? By being made sin for you. That's how he does it. You've got to remember there's no time in heaven. And so what he did 2,000 years ago is just like he did it today. For you. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14. How much more... Shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. That's how he removes your shame. Every drop of blood that he shed removes the shame from you. That's how God forgives. You've been cleansed. You've been called out of darkness. Now there's a difference. God's not calling you out. Jeff, I'm calling you out. Jeff, you jerk. <laughs> After all I've done for you, look what you did, you stupid man. God doesn't do that to you. God never calls you out. No, he calls you out of darkness. That's different. Jeff. And that's all it takes. He's calling you out of darkness. Hallelujah. (laughs) And what is he doing? He's clothing you once again with glory. With glory. Catch this. With glory, hallelujah, even though you can't see it, the glory of God is on you today. Close your eyes and lift your hands. Every moment, once again, once you accept his forgiveness, hallelujah, everything begins to change. But you have to accept him here. When that begins to happen in your heart, then you can do... The second part, you can bring your guilt into the light. The antidote. You know what an antidote is? The antidote to guilt. The antidote to shame. Is confession. It's just the opposite of what we want to do. But faith gives you the courage to do it. Why? Because you you have just accepted his forgiveness. David declares in Psalms 32, verse 3, When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long remember shame will attack you all day long for day and night your hand was heavy upon me my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer have you ever been there verse 5 but then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Hallelujah. Isn't that awesome? Now the power you need 
to do this. I love what Jeff said, because God's going to do this in you and through you. The power you need to do this doesn't come from you. It's the fruit that's coming out of faith. Remember a good treasure brings forth good fruit? And faith is a good treasure to have in your heart. Is this helping anyone here today? Faith is God's gift to you. Oh, receive that faith. Believe God today. You know the tree by its fruit. Are you catching this? And so when faith is living in you, when you have a living faith, you bring your guilt into the light. And you don't hide it. You you don't pretend that it's not there. Can you see this? So, So your confession becomes the fruit of your faith. And faith becomes this good treasure that's living in your heart. Isn't this awesome? Now, now 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7, Paul writes, Now we, we now have, say now have. Now say now. I have it now. now. Do you believe that? Believe yeah. If you believe it, that's faith. See, we, we now have this light shining in our what? Hearts. But we ourselves are like fragile Clay jars. Have you ever had a beautiful clay jar and you bumped it wrong and it cracked? They can look really pretty. And you can spend a lot of money on them, but if you don't, if you're not careful, it can crack. But look what Paul says. We ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great, what? Treasure. This makes it clear. That our great power is from God, not from ourselves. So the antidote to guilt, the antidote to shame is confession. Hallelujah. Now you know that God loves you. Hallelujah. Now you know that there's a place for you. Hallelujah. Now you know that God's covering your life. Amen. Hallelujah. Just lift your hands. Thank God today. Do you know that? Now you know. And when you know that, book of James chapter 5, it says, And the prayer of faith will what? Save the sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Hallelujah. That's accepting God's forgiveness. And then to bring your, your guilt into the light, it says in verse 16, Confess your trespasses. Where? To one another. And pray for one another that you may be healed. Maybe the healing you're looking for is just one prayer away. But it's not going to come from you. It's going to come from someone else. And for that healing to manifest, you're going to have to trust God. Because you're going to have to confess your trespass. Oh, are you getting this today? But the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Are you glad you came today? Is this okay, Collins? Only believers who know that they have been forgiven by God and also forgiven by the body of Christ would ever do this. Only people who have received and accepted this mighty forgiveness from God, only people who know that God has specifically placed them in the body of Christ Specifically, place them. Behold, I I go to make a place for you. Only believers would ever confess their guilt. Only 
only believers would ever confess their shame one to another. The sinner will always hide their sin. Have you noticed that? Only the believer with faith in their heart will confess their fault. Right? Can you see the difference? Thank God for the Holy Ghost. What does the Holy Spirit do? He always will come to you, not to pat you on the back. Hey, Jane, it's so nice to see you. I love you so much. No, he comes to convict you of sin. Aren't you glad you came today? Turn to someone and say, I really don't like this right now. I'm really uncomfortable. I'd really, can we go home? No, the Holy Ghost comes to convict you. Why does he do that? He wants you to see that there's no way out. Yeah, you're really guilty. (laughs) He comes to expose the things that are in your heart. The treasures that are in you that you think are really good when they're really evil. You think it's the truth when it's really a lie of the devil. And you've possessed that thing and you've placed it in your heart. And you refuse to let go of that shame. I've paid a lot for that shame. We've all done it. <laughs> Lou's the only one that hasn't done any of this. No, no, right, don't. No. We've all done it, haven't we? <laughs> Why does the Holy Spirit do that? He wants to expose the things. He comes to reveal the things in our hearts that we treasure the most. Why? So when our eyes are opened, we'll have the faith to know what to do. You know what I got to do, God? I got to confess this. And all of a sudden, The power of God is flowing in the church. All of a sudden, healing is flowing in the church. Hallelujah. Blind eyes are opening. Demons are being cast out. New tongues are coming on people. You become a sign and a wonder. Simply because you're beginning to confess or bring your guilt into the light. Glory, glory, glory. glory. Aren't you glad you came today? (laughs) One more scripture on this. 1 Peter 4, it Eight, it says, above all things, church, this is our word, above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will what? Cover a multitude of sins. Just like what God did for the believer when you get born again. God does not cover your sin so you can continue in it. That's not love. But God will expose the shame so that its influence in your heart can be taken away. And as you confess your guilt, as you confess your your shame, what does God do? What does the church do? Well, love will cover you. Hallelujah. That's God's glory. Oh, lift your hands. I want you to see the glory of God today. The glory of God comes on you to clothe you, not to expose you. Hallelujah. And when you know that you've been forgiven, when you know your shame has been removed, when you know that the treasure in your heart has been replaced with good things, that's repentance at work. Oh, hallelujah. How do we remove guilt and shame? Well, first you need to accept God's forgiveness and love. You need to bring that guilt into the light. And then thirdly, you need to make amends where possible. Jesus declared, produce fruit that proves your repentance. If you've really repented, And that tree is growing in you. It'll produce a fruit. Other people can see it. Amen. 
Now, this is not something you only do once. It becomes a new way of living. Can you see that? When your shame is removed, other people can see it. What happened to that guy? I've, I've never seen him smile like that before. Did you see so-and-so dancing today? They've never done that. What happened? Remember the story of Zacchaeus? The guy that everyone hated in town. And Jesus had the audacity. Zacchaeus, I see you running that camera today. Zacchaeus, I say, come down. I'm going to your house for dinner. Did you hear what Jesus just did? The gall of him to eat with sinners. You know the story. I'd love to hear the conversation. All we know is at the end of the day, Zacchaeus stood up. Luke 19, verse 8. It says, Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. Remember, he was a thief. There's other terms we could use right now, but I'm not going to use them because we're in a political climate, so we're not going to go there. And he says, if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. Notice what Jesus said. Today, salvation has come to this house. How did Jesus know that? Because the treasure changed. What was Zacchaeus' treasure? Money. The love of money. The lust for things. And in one moment of time, he confessed his shame and that love was removed. And he just began to become a supernatural giver. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Guilt and shame can, can easily get lodged in our heart. But the antidote is confession. Say confession. When guilt is removed, it'll open your eyes to see things that you couldn't see before and it'll cause you to do new things and because of the repentance you'll do crazy things to make amends I release upon you the the courage and the favor and the grace to make amends in every circumstance of life that the Holy Spirit would bring to your remembrance receive it say Lord I receive (laughs) when you change the treasure you change the fruit. Say it with me. When you change the treasure, you change the fruit. That's a challenge to me. How about you? I want to close with one verse. I want it to become your memory verse for this week, all right? Memory verse, 1 John 5, 4. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Faith is the treasure that you place in your heart. In the very moment you confess, every drop of blood that Jesus shed in that moment, removes the shame from you. And all of the lusts of this world lose their power over you. And the devil cannot stop you from receiving the love of God. Amen. That's how God forgives. You've been cleansed this morning. You've been called out of darkness this morning. And he clothes you with his glory. If you want to remove shame from your life, just stand up right where you are. Right where you are. And by the standing to your feet, let that be an acknowledgement. And let God do what only he can do in your heart. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. All over this house. Anyone. My goodness.
And the things of earth will grow strangely dim. All the lusts of the world are losing its power over you right now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. We're going to war in the spirit right now. The devil can't win this. The devil can't win this because the blood has already been shed. And I got to say, all I know is your life is wonderful. And your, your life is going to be more wonderful. Why? Because you're making Jesus absolute Lord over every part of your life. And when you begin to treasure Jesus more than you treasure yourself, it's really tough for, I, I, I pray for our uh, young adults in these days because everything is so self-absorbed. They were born into this world and that's what we thought was a better way for them to live. How many know us as parents, we didn't help them out very much. Now, when you treasure Jesus more than you treasure yourself, when you treasure Jesus more than you treasure your hurt, when you treasure Jesus more than you treasure your tradition, then miracles begin to come out of your life more abundantly than you can ask or think. Why? Because there's no limit in God. Lift your hands and say, Lord, I receive your grace. I receive your forgiveness right now in Jesus' name. God's plan for your life hasn't changed. He said, I'm going to give you a pure heart. And I'm going to give you a right spirit. Maybe you're here today and your heart really isn't pure. You don't know why. It doesn't really matter why. God wants to make it pure. Maybe you're here today and, and you have a wrong spirit. You don't have a right attitude. Maybe your attitude stinks this morning. Amen. Guess what? The will of God for you is that you have a right spirit. He wants to make your attitude right. Does that make sense? Well, how is he going to do that? It won't happen by you sitting by yourself in a closet at home by yourself. Say, Jesus, Jesus, make me right. It doesn't work that way. No, you got to go to someone in the church. You got to go to someone in this church and say, you know what? I got a problem in my heart. Would you pray for me? And guess what happens? God will make your spirit right. God will make your heart pure simply because you walk by faith and you do that. Does that make any sense today? So what I want us to do this morning, uh, right now, because this is a holy moment. Can, Jeff, can you feel the presence of God? Can you feel the presence? We're going to shift into prayer. It's going to be kind of a, a, an interesting time. We're going to begin to pray for one another. We're going to confess our guilt one to another. And I encourage you to do that up here at the altar. Make it a holy place. And watch what begins to happen in your heart as you begin to do that. Does it make sense? We're going to worship the Lord. So what I want you to do, bring your offerings and set them in the uh, offering receptacles. Uh, and, and pray with the right person. What does that mean? Well, who in this room do you trust? I don't know who that is. Maybe you have a word from God, just like uh, the Lord uh, gave uh, Merlin a, a word in the middle of the night. Maybe there's something in your heart for someone else. I just got to go pray with Amy. I got to go, where's Thomas? I just got something in my heart for Tom. You know, maybe it's Brian. I don't know who it is, but just let the Holy Spirit use you today. Can you join hands together real close as we do this? Father, we give back to you our, this morning our first fruits, our tithes, and our offerings. And Lord, we, we position ourselves for miracles this morning. And we thank you that you're changing the treasure in our hearts. In Jesus' mighty name. So I'd like the deacons to help us in prayer. Jeff, if you'd help us pray this morning. Pastor David this morning. Hallelujah. If you're up to it, Pastor Jan, help us in prayer this morning.